thank you so much for uh, participating in the uh, FAC uh, 2.0. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Davis. I'm the uh, new superintendent here for the Oshkosh Area School District. I know I've met a lot of you, but but not all of you. So uh, certainly uh, welcome, welcome to the group. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to, to uh, get this kicked off and and, uh, and really be part of the uh, the planning. Uh, I'll tell you that part of what I when I was researching the district and looking at. Um, you know, viability of, of this job and, and the opportunities that come from it. One of the things that really stuck out for me in my research was the district having a long range facilities plan. So a four phase facilities plan that had some real tangible targets at it and a successful referendum that it, it recently passed it was really lucrative to me. Um, and I think provides us with some really good momentum and some a path moving forward. We know one of the things, or some of the areas that we weren't able to get to in the first phase of the referendum was the co-curricular um, facilities. Um, looking at indoor practice facilities, outdoor competitive spaces, auditorium, um, swimming areas, um, along with our, our uh, performing arts spaces. And so um, we wanted to make sure that not a lot of time lapsed between passing the first referendum and getting that work kicked off, and then doing some planning uh, for how we're gonna address the real needs that we have um, at our schools around our co-curricular facilities. I think there's some real energy um, coming from the school board to make that happen. We know that our co-curriculars are a vital part of our school experience. Um, that's a lot of what brings families in. It's a lot of what keeps families here. Um, and we know that our facilities um, just aren't what they need to be for us to compete with our peers. And so we're taking a real look at this. Um, so I want to just you know, let you know that this is a genuine, a genuine effort. This isn't just some window dressing. This is a genuine effort to see what we can do both in the short term and then plan in the long term um, as we're looking at our, our facilities plans as we're, as we're moving forward. So again, thank you for taking the time. Uh, we have the, the bigger group um, here for the first meeting and then for the last meeting, we'll bring you back. Um, so again, we have our, our core committee, the uh, FAC 2.0 core committee. Uh, and then our subject matter experts um, that we're going to bring in when we're talking about uh, some of our particular areas. So, so I think if we just go around, since we have everybody here, um, just go around and introduce ourselves um, and whether or not we're on the core committee um, or a subject matter expert, if you're a subject matter expert, kind of what, you're, what you'll be representing on the area that you'll, uh, that you'll represent. So, um, so why don't we just go around the room and just uh, provide names and, and go from there. So we'll start right here. Okay. Um, I'm Kirsten Martin. And I'm on the core committee. My name is Susan Harris, and I'm on the core committee. Kay Weber, I'm on the core committee. Karen Bullen, core committee. Jim Chitwood, core committee. Will Depius, core committee. Julie Baker, core committee. Julia Salomon, core committee. Uh, Kim Nguyen, uh, since I don't think I'm a subject matter expert, expert, I must be on the core committee. <laughs> yes. Let's <laughs> uh, Abler, core committee. Jay Gibson, core committee. Herb Berenson, core committee. Taylor Reitz, committee as well. Great, Clint, you want to? Uh, Clint Sally with Bray Architects. Uh, Dave Gallock, deputy superintendent. All right, when we start, coach, you want to start back on your side? <coughs> yeah, sure. Uh, ben Matthew, I'm the uh, head football coach at Oscars West. Uh, I'm a subject matter expert in high school football. Can we have a committee? Boris. Um, subject matter expert, aquatics. Craig Leader, North AD. Uh, Nicole Pogquist for North Soccer Girls. Steve Danza, North High School, uh, subject matter expert, outdoor performance. Brad Janarski, Oshkosh West Athletics and Activities. Uh, Matt Callahan, uh, representing uh, soccer. Tim Cole, um, Oshkosh West varsity softball, and I think I'm on the indoor committee. Jeremy Hatton, I'm the Executive Director of Business Services. Hi, Tim Brown, Director of Lighting. Matt Cameron, Director of People Services. I'm Andy Jones, I'm the Executive Director of Administration. Luca Oshkosh North, the football coach. Kathy Kipmer, North Principal and Core Committee. Dan Singer, a band director at West High School, and a subject matter expert will be for the Performing Arts Facility. I'm Jennifer Henselin, and I'm the drama teacher at North, so I'm here for performance arts as well. Here's Dr. Ulrich, choir director at North, here for performing arts. Randy Sutton, former choir director here at North, and performing arts facility. 
All right. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, you can see we've got a, a wide variety of expertise. Um, that'll be really important as we're working through this process uh, over the upcoming months. And, and uh, so we've got a lot of details to go through and give you a little bit of a vision uh, of where we're headed, a little background, um, and then uh, we've got some um, some feedback that we'll get uh, certainly from, from the core committee as we're getting things kicked off. So again, thank you so much for coming, and I'll kick it over to uh, Dr. Cunha. All right. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody. Um, part of part of my role in this today is give you a little bit of background and a summary. And I'm not sure when it happened. I used to be the new guy in the district, but now apparently I become the historian. So I don't know when that happened. I still miss the days of Dr. Bob Geigley, in case any of you remember Bob. He was definitely the historian. So, um, sort of timing. How did this all start, and where did it all come from? Uh, back in 2017. Uh, the school board hired, uh, hired Bray Architects to take a look at all of our facilities. We knew our facilities were old. We knew that the, uh, through the strategic planning process, we had gone through a couple of strategic plans. And the community kept coming up with the same thing over and over. They really wanted us to have a long-range plan for our facilities. So the study highlighted about $116 million in repairs to some of our aging schools. Uh, many of these schools were over 100 years old, so we knew this was a major problem and we wanted to come up with a plan to deal with that problem. So it took a little while for us to move through some of this, get some of that information going, and um, the Facility Advisory Committee 1.0 was created. It was a group that came into this with a blank slate. There was no preconceived notions, it was just what are we going to do and how are we going to do with deal with this long term and their goal was to present to the school board on, on that work. Now the board, and this is going to make it sound really quick and easy, it was not quick nor was it easy, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the committee eventually came up with a consolidation plan that everybody could live with. Mm -hmm. Now those of you who've been in Oshkosh for a long time know we've talked about consolidating too many, too few schools, whatever it works out to be, and to get a consensus on the school board that was 7-0, that yep, this is where we ought to go, was a big deal. So the board unanimously approved the plan, and the community approved the referendum for operations as well as capital. Uh, that was in November of 2020. So last year, uh, obviously we had November approval of both referenda, and we began to design, and we now have a name, uh, we began to design Bell Phillips Middle School. Okay, that design is, is virtually complete. In fact, we're gonna have groundbreaking here coming up very soon, uh, and the design for the new middle school is going to be occurring, um, or new elementary school. Um, the other thing that happened was once we got a four-phase consolidation plan put in, and we did some information on exactly what that is, just as a reminder for those of you who may have forgotten. Um, the board looked at it, and we also had a lot of input from many of you in this room who said, what about our athletic performance spaces, our athletic practice spaces, our performing arts spaces, our aquatic spaces. We have some serious needs here. That's not in the facility consolidation plan, and that's true. So what we did is we kind of went back to the board and said, well, what do you want us to do? And they said, well, can't we reconstitute that facility advisory group or a different facility advisory group, have them pour over the information, have them bring back the recommendation to us, and then we will see where and how we can integrate it with our four-phase consolidation plan. Um, so they came up with the, the, the concept of Facility Advisory Committee 2.0. Um, your, your role as FAC 2.0 members is to propose options, renovations, and upgrades that are safe, accessible, efficient, and equitable in addressing outdoor athletic competition and practice, indoor athletic and multi-purpose practice facilities, uh, fine arts performance facilities, plural, uh, aquatic competition and practice facilities. So those are the four big, big boulders that we are here to take a peek at. Um, we want to encourage participation, inspire success, and promote the many talents of our, of our the children in our community. Um, our hope is to maximize the reuse of the existing spaces we have. Uh, the one thing that Oshkosh is, is they're very cost conscious, and that's a good thing. And, and the cool part about these committees is we always represent that. So this group here is the Facility Advisory Committee. You represent the community. Your, your role here is to evaluate the options presented. You're probably going to have to do some prioritization. 
of options presented and make recommendations uh, to the Board of Education that's in synergy with the facility consolidation plan. That's kind of what the board's looking for for you. Now the subject matter experts were here to provide, they are your counsel, you know. They will provide information to you, they'll be able to answer questions, they're going to be able to provide great ideas around what are the needs in our current facilities and what are needs in our future facilities. What can we do today? What can we not do today that we really want to be able to do tomorrow? Um, they will also serve as a liaison between the countless other subject matter experts that are not able to be with us. So they are sort of a two-way conduit. So when you have questions and you pose it to them, and they will probably know the answer to most of them, they might not know the answer to some of them. Well, they'll have homework, they'll go back, communicate, bring back that input back to you. So they're, they're your eyes and ears and your experts in all the different pieces that you're gonna look at. Obviously, district administration is here to help as well, and we can provide information that we have uh, or what, anything else you need. <coughs> right, I think I'll turn it over to Clint. Let me do quick the left one. Um, so I, a lot of your names and faces, uh, although you, we didn't, I don't think we had the masks back then, it's hard to remember exactly, but a lot of your names and faces look familiar. So again, really appreciative of you guys committing, uh, again, the time to kind of go through this process. Uh, if you remember last time, we did this in six meetings. Uh, and again, looking back, um, it was pretty, obviously a pretty daunting task. I know the first three, two or three meetings, I think a lot of, a lot of the sentiment is like, what are, we, how, what are we doing? What are we doing? How are we going to get there? And we obviously got there. I, I, um, I'm hopeful in this process, there's a little bit less of the arduous kind of talking about what we have, because a lot of what we're, we, we are talking about in this case is, is you know, newer or potentially shared facilities. So um, really, as we outline this, because there are sort of four specific projects. We, we thought it probably made more sense to sort of focus on each of the individual projects rather than um, all of them together um, throughout the process. So as we looked at the building, the schedule, we kind of we kind of outlined, okay, really giving ourselves kind of two meetings to really focus in on um, the first uh, for each of the topics. So the first meeting really defining need and, and potentially looking at some various uh, options. Uh, or, or the other piece is going to be kind of learning, well, what, what is an indoor facility? What are other school districts across the state doing um, for those types of facilities? So I think, you know, meeting one's going to be kind of learning, understanding, uh, defining um, some of those needs. And then the, the second meeting for each of the subject will be, you know, talking about location, timing, cost, uh, you know, discussing options, discussing some of those other uh, more fine, finer granule things. Um, it's possible as we go through this, um, maybe one of these topics needs a little more time. We'll, we'll, we'll have to, again, work through, but we want to, again, be respectful, be uh, um, uh, as, as um, ex expeditious kind of going through this and really kind of addressing all of these all the way through. Again, um, with, with a kind of a late May uh, time frame in mind for this. So, again, I think if we could do the entire district in six meetings, I, I think we can uh, tackle these issues in, in 10. So, again, looking forward to this and, and the input the subject matter experts will provide for each of their various topics. I think it's back to you, Dave. Uh -huh. Okay, um, so uh, this was the cost-benefit study that we, we talked about. Just want to give you a little bit of a context. Uh, as we look at the phase one work and why we did what we did, why did we start with Merrill, why did we work on Webster? Well, if you look at some of these facilities, uh, Merrill was one of the top in terms of the cost of just getting that facility up and running, you know, and, and fixing the, the various components. But we had $116 million dollars uh, of needs and by building a new Merrill, uh, just to give you an example, um, 5.3 and 8.2 million dollars go away. So just to give you an idea of why those facilities were selected at the time they were selected. And if you add up, um, let's see here, Merrill, uh, Webster, 3.2, Washington, 3.6, uh, Merrill down here in the middle side, 8.2, Webster, 4.4, you begin to see how fast that racked up. And, and while it didn't pay for the entire project by any stretch, it was a heck of a, heck, we took a lot of costs off the books by doing that. <coughs> I think this is yours. Up until we had an 
Uh, again, similarly, last time we went through uh, a similar charge, and uh, you know, again, we, we really focused on, like, like you said, more and more of the learning environment side of things. Uh, again, making sure we're, we're cost efficient and useful, uh, and then again, um, giving the students the spaces they need uh, to succeed. Um, it's in innovative, uh, accommodating technology. Again, some of the Merrill and, and Webster kind of real thick walls. It's tough to kind of. Uh, open things up and kind of provide the the various educational spaces. I think you'll see um, in within the Val Phillips building when you're able to get in there eventually. I have a question. Yes. Um, one of the really cool things about the last uh, uh, facilities advisory committee was the participation of students. Um, do we have students yes. in this Yes, yeah, we, we have a couple, but they were not able, I don't believe they were able to attend. Mm -hmm. Oh, we have one here, but okay. I don't think both are here today. Yeah. Oh, cool, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So this, yeah the problem we ran into was the previous ones, they went off and graduated on us. So <laughs> they, they, they're not here anymore. Is this still here or mine? Um, I can take it otherwise, it doesn't matter. I can go through. Oh, go ahead. Uh, again, as we looked at the process, we, we started off with the, the uh, current uh, configuration. Again, just for those of you that weren't here, I'll, I'll, or for those of you that were here, I'll try to go brief for the, those of you that weren't. Uh, I'll try, to, try my best to kind of explain where we went. But this was a diagram of what the district looked like previously. So again, uh, a number of elementary schools feeding into five middle schools feeding into the two high schools. Um, our uh, option B, as, as we uh, coined it for the pathway, was uh, to go to, um, on the west side, to potentially go to five um, elementary schools leading into two middle schools leading into west. Again, this kind of represents up here, it says this, this would be phase two, would be the, the middle school elementary school side. Phase three would go to address west. Phase one is what we're currently under with um, consolidation of uh, the elementary schools there, building new Webster, building new Merrill, and then phase four would be uh, addressing North um, High School. So again, here's kind of just a, a, a blow up of this. Again, four elementary schools on the north side feeding into the new Merrill, feeding into North, and then a blow up on the, um, on, on the west side um, with again what we envision will be five elementary schools feeding into two middle schools feeding into west again the, there's a little bit of an imbalance with the, the population um, and we obviously have the, the river running through providing our boundary so again the, the you know west is a, is a is a bigger high school for those of you that don't know that but west is a, a little bit bigger than, than north and just population wise uh, the west side is a little bit bigger um, than, the, than the north side so again, phase two is really um, um, planning to tackle this. Again, exactly what we do at the middle school level, the main goal is to get down to uh, two middle schools. So again, it will either be uh, a new South Park or a massive addition renovation uh, to South Park to allow uh, the Tipler students to um, filter into uh, both of those facilities. And then again, uh, addressing the elementary needs uh, on, on the west side. And again, to Dave's point, we're hopeful that comes sooner rather than later, but um, again, no immediate timetable for that. A little more granular detail. Again, these were our, our kind of our points that we ultimately brought to the board. So again, replacement of Merrill, um, replacement of Webster with a single high school, um, replacement of Webster, Merrill, and Washington with a new um, um, elementary school. Uh, which obviously closes um, Washington, both Merrill Middle and uh, Merrill Elementary, Webster um, Elementary and Middle, and then uh, again, um, reboundering a, a bit of the students um, into the, the new, new scenario. So again, we, we always talked about um, I believe five buildings down to uh, two buildings, um, three sites down to two sites was kind of the, the way we sort of always looked at the process. The next one we can kind of show That's that. So, okay. so uh, <clears throat> a picture is worth a thousand words. So in a nutshell, we're going from five schools on three sites to two schools on two sites. So the question people always ask is when and where do the kids go? Uh, which we'd like to figure out ourselves because that's kind of an important thing. So here's what we currently have. We have the Merrill Webster site. We have Washington. Those are the schools. 
we're going to be building Bell Phillips Middle School breaking ground here. Once that is completed in the fall of 2023, okay, so that's after next school year, um, all the kids from Merrill Middle and Webster Middle are going to go to that school. Okay, step one complete. At the same time, uh, as we are finishing this facility, we're going to be getting the construction of the new elementary school, which is going to be on the Webster site currently. So the current Webster Stanley is going to be demolished and there's going to be a new elementary school built on site. Okay? That's going to open a year later in fall of 2024. During this year, while this is being constructed, we had to get the elementary kids out of here. So what they're going to do is um, they are actually, the Webster Elementary students are going to go to the Merrill site in that interim year. Okay, so they're, Merrill, the current Merrill building is going to hold all of Merrill Elementary, all of Webster Elementary. Obviously, the new middle school right next door is going to be housing Merrill Middle and Webster Middle kids. So that will allow us to demolish Webster. And then we can go ahead and transition the following year, and we'll have two schools on two sites. So Washington will no longer be needed. Obviously, we've consolidated down to the Webster site being one elementary school. The near Merrill site, which is Bell Phillips Middle School, will be the new middle school. So that's it's a little bit of juggling for one year while the construction's occurring, but uh, by 2024, we'll all be in our the appropriate spots. Can you, go, can you go back to the, uh, the where you have the arrows? Sure. I think I can. <laughs> can you just scroll the opposite way? Uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, there we go. Yep. So then where do the Washington Elementary kids go while they're in the elementary schools? Uh, they can stay at Washington. Because we're not doing anything with Washington until they move to the new elementary, and then the board's going to have to decide what to do with that physical site. So, good question. Thought I missed some kids there. Well, you got everybody accounted for. This one's back to you. Uh, so again, we're we're really proud and excited uh, about the the Bell, Bell Phillips uh, Middle School. Again, when we did the renderings, we still were just using generic new new middle school for for a lot of the things. But uh, again, um, really proud of. of our work with with the district um, we met you know continuously with staff continuously with uh, various staff at each of the buildings um, trying to make sure that we're getting feedback um, both from uh, Merrill and Webster teachers um, to to create the building uh, again not not to go too much into the kind of the concept but um, this will actually be a, a three-story academic wing back here so each floor kind of represents one grade level six seven eight uh, this core piece is a lot of our shared functions and our cafeteria uh, are in the center of, of the kind of the, the layout of the building and then kind of there's a, a little bit of a kind of breezeway pass through then kind of to what i'll call kind of our extracurriculars additional extracurriculars band and music uh, and then our gymnasium are in that that south uh, block so again um, didn't want to dwell too much on that tonight um, we are really excited about this and um, really proud of, again, proud of the work um, in conjunction with, with the district and, and staff. Is that, is that from facing Jackson? Or what, what's, what's north, south, and east, and west? Uh, it's not Jackson. Jackson's on the other side of the building. That's Kentucky. Right. It's I, think it's, yeah. I just forget the name. Is it yeah. Kentucky? Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. yeah, so this is kind of looking uh, west. west, west, northwest. Yeah. Yeah. This is going down. Yeah, Jackson would be the opposite side. We really, uh, again, uh, not to get too much into the design, but as we were considering the building, Jackson being a really, really busy street, uh, there was a lot of concern that, you know, that being the main entrance and kind of the point of point of entry. So uh, we did kind of focus things a little bit more on, on the Kentucky side for, for the main entrance for the building. Uh, not to get lost in this process, uh, this past summer, so summer 21, right. uh, we did do a number of secure entry projects um, at uh, the school district. So it was kind of our first round of secure entry projects. I'll say those were the quote unquote easier projects, meaning there were no addition renovation, or there were no additions as part of those. There were only uh, um, interior renovations. Um, we're just getting, um, starting to plan forward for um, this coming summer's work, so um, Oakwood um, uh, will be one that potentially gets an, an addition included uh, within that. So the next kind of phase of secure entries are the, I'll say, a little more complicated ones.
Uh, again, quick synopsis of, of the phase two work. So again, uh, replacement or remodel of South Park. Uh, remodel uh, the, the elementary schools. Again, modernized learning uh, spaces. Uh, again, shifting around to accommodate additional students for, for reducing the number of buildings. Uh, repurposing Tipler and Sh the Shapiro buildings. They would no longer, again, uh, function in their co uh, current uh, usage as a middle school and elementary or STEM Academy, uh, and then potentially the closure of um, Roosevelt, Shapiro, and Tipler. So again, um, the goal would, first goal for those as stated would be to repurpose, but there is possible that we would close those buildings as well. And then again, phase three, um, looking at Oshkosh, again, renovation or, and or replacement. Uh, and then phase four would be uh, this building, North. Um, so we did have uh, we did have a, a, in our agenda kind of time to, to talk. I think we will go into the financial piece, and then we'll 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 have a, a little bit of just a, a discussion piece. So we'll kick it off to Drew, Drew now. Hey, Dave. Yes. We talk to because the way it reads it says that those buildings would be closed, so those, those people would be redistributed, correct? Yes. That that those buildings would be just those that eliminated the staff and the students, etc. I mean, staff would be correct. Yeah, the kid, the staff go where the kids go. Every time. So that's the mouse right there. All right. So just on the on the financial aspect of all of this, um, just some high level things to remember, and we'll be kind of touching on mm -hmm. these as we go through these meetings. Um, referendum dollars, um, there's a very good likelihood, obviously, that these projects are going to have to be funded via a referendum. Those dollars are very restricted by law. So as we go through and, and we'll have some conversations as we, as we start getting the scope of what these projects are going to look like, uh, we'll be coming back to how does that look on a referendum question. Um, you're very limited on what the question says is where the money has to go to. Um, nothing outside of where the question is, is where money can go. So we're, we're pretty limited, and that is a good thing. It's, it's an accountability back to the community of where, those fun, where they pass the funds to go and where those funds actually end up. So that'll be something we continue to kind of come back and reference. Also, we're, we are going to be using um, the Recreation Department, which in the fund, fund accounting is Fund 80. We, we will be utilizing that for... Um, the, these facilities, partly to help manage the facilities. Um, there's also the potential that depending on where we, this group lands on how we want some of the indoor, the practice facility kind of a space, wherever we land on that, Fund 80 could actually be housed or actually really fully run it for community revenue as well and community, bringing other outside youth club um, activities in for weekends and rental spaces and, and things of that nature. So we will be utilizing that. Again, one thing to remember with that, that DPI, there's, again, the, the switching between funds and going between a, a Fund 80, which is Recreation Department, and a Fund 10, which is our general budget. The more we can separate and not have that within a building, a current building, so a practice space. One thing we like about having a shared practice space, we're not in and attached to one of our high school buildings. As we attach it, the DPI is not as big on sharing that with the recreation department. Drew, um, can I add just one thing to that? Yeah. It, it, one of the other important things to know about Fund 80 is that it doesn't have the same rules uh, for the revenue limit that we'd have uh, for our general fund. And so that allows us to be able to create more revenue and not be as restricted by the state. So the more that we can use Fund 80 in an appropriate way that's approved by the DPI, especially when we're talking like indoor practice facilities and being able to not only use it for our kids and community, but also for all of these you know, youth clubs and all of that world that's going on. The more that we can take advantage of these opportunities using Fund 80, the better, um, because we can staff that, we can get our rec department involved in that, um, and that'll be a big advantage for us. That's something that Drew's been working on. Um, we got validation of um, this past week. So that's, that's an important measure as we're moving forward. Okay. Thank you. 
the, the last thing to remember, um, which is something that general people don't, don't understand, the way we get aided by the state for the state portion of our aid, we, we, this is all gonna be at a level where the district receives 15% of our spending. So if we spend a dollar at this level, we're getting 15 cents back from the state. So as we build these projects, and as you look at our current project, the $107 million project, the state gave us 15% of that money in additional aid. So we, we captured a little bit more than $15 million of aid, which comes from the Ninas, the Menashas, the Final Acts, all, all around the state. It comes from Kimberly, too. Kim Kimberly does a little extra share because they're a little extra up there. So, so we're able to capture that extra money and extra aid the way we're funded to, to help offset that. So it, it does, it's, there's a big dollar amount when you talk 107 million, but we got a lot of extra additional state aid that we wouldn't have otherwise by, by doing this from the state. Again, we'll, we'll kind of be hitting on some of these as we go through and bring this back as, as we work together. All right, so again, uh, hopefully you guys felt in the last process, process that uh, those of you that were here, that, that you know, in some of the early ones are a little more sit and get in terms of us talking a lot and a little less interaction. Again, we want to be mindful that this part of the big part of this process is us listening uh, to some of the feedback. So I guess just a, a bit of a pause here. Um, we did have, um, you know, little uh, table um, mats or whatever. Uh, if you want to jot, if anything pops in your head as you're going through, whether it's just notes for yourself or, or notes for us um, as we're going through, um, we, we, we do want to kind of encourage some group work again in future meetings as we go through, kind of talking through some of the, the topics that we're going through. Uh, tonight's presentation probably doesn't have quite as you know much gravitas to uh, encourage uh, the, uh, the, the, the group work. So I, I guess just want to pause here right now just to I guess any thoughts or comments um, as we kind of transition now into more a little bit of the meat, of, meat and potatoes of what we're discussing tonight. So any questions? Comments, concerns? I have a question, just I need to refresh my memory. Um, I don't remember what the question was on the referendum. And are we restricted to only performing arts and sports? Or is some of that money going to be spent on other things? Well, other than the security, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, so I mean, the the referendum really was, I, I would say that that phase one, sort of those those uh, points. So it was building a new middle school, building a new elementary school, uh, doing secure entry work at, at a number of the facilities, and then um, there was also an infrastructure piece as well. So if you recall, I, a couple of the big items there were, were roofing. Uh, at, at many of the buildings, uh, electrical service at both high school buildings was another um, big ticket item. So those are really the four four things that the referendum included. I'd say the topics that we're going to discuss as part of this committee, what, what, what we have we have all the money uh, accounted for that that we're going to spend as part of the past referendum with with those four items. Um, so again, what we're discussing would be a future referendum, a future question that would be asked or a future donation that yet to be made. So will this committee also contribute input as to, for lack of better terms, what things are gonna go into the new school? Like, let's say, no, okay. No, no. so, so we're, we're, really, we're really looking to, to the future. So some of that's gonna be an assessment of what was passed and what our needs are from that point. Uh, but really looking into the future. So whether again that's a, a private donation or you know a, a second referendum down the road type of thing, it's kind of shaping shaping that. And I would anticipate you know uh, some of these projects to be able to be kind of a private partner or a private public partnership. That could be could certainly be. Okay. So where when I guess or maybe I'm getting to the weeds. If if there are. Uh, proposals or suggestions or recommendations for anything outside of performing arts and, and facility and uh, sports. Mm -hmm. Who do we bring that to? I, I think it's valid to bring it up to this group. But again, I think part of part of the intention for this group, and, and not to use too common of a phrase, is a little bit of a catch-all. Again, kind of recognizing we. 
we spent a little bit, I think, too much on the specific buildings and maybe didn't, didn't, didn't think about some of those bigger picture items in terms of, uh, again, some of the community and amenities with it. So, so yeah, if, 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 there, if there's something here that, you know, I, I don't know, make, make, make up, I don't know, a, a, a bocce ball court, I don't know. <laughs> I'm tr trying to think of something silly, but maybe that's not silly. Sorry, sorry to have been the, the bocce ball enthusiast here. Um, but you know, it, it, we need a bocce ball stadium. I, I think that that would be something. I think part of this group that you know, if, if there's other opportunities or things we, could, we want to think of and, and know to think of, I think these four are the ones that we've specifically heard from, uh, you know, from staff and dis district people that that we we really needed to focus on. And, and, and again, with, with kind of the direction from the board. But if there is something else, we certainly, I think, we should consider it as well. Yeah. So one of the things that, that has come up since the referendum is, you know, Oshkosh is going to be home to a lot of Afghani refugees. And Oshkosh, Monroe County, is one of the counties in the state that, that, that uh, welcomes refugees. So, you know, a, a family welcome center or, you know, something like that. So that's where I was going. Okay, right. And I realize it's not the purpose of this committee, but I was just wondering where you know, those kind of proposals that Okay, great point, great point. Yeah, I was curious, I could be just faulty memory, but the extra 15% that the state gives us in equalization aid, is that something that we should keep in our back pocket and tell people about when, if, when I'm thinking about promoting the very good things that came out of the past referendum, that that was money that I don't, we wouldn't have had had we not passed that. So I don't know if that if that's gonna, if that continues, that should be part of what we tell people. Right, right. And, and actually, that if you remember, that was one of the points that we didn't stress too much, but we stressed a little bit when we went down the referendum road. We talked about the fact that Oshkosh had had, had a relative drought of referenda, while other communities jumped on referenda, and we and all. What people did not realize was that all of us in Oshkosh were paying for the Kimberley's referenda, the Menashe's referenda, et cetera. We all paid for their stuff. And by us not going to referendum, we gave everybody else a pass on paying for our stuff. So yeah, yeah, being able to take that, and we, we've actually had that conversation of being more intentional about if it, once we have specific dollar amounts, we can actually calculate exactly how many millions of dollars that represents, and then use that to communicate to the taxpayers and say, look, we understand it's going to cost X, but X is decreased by Y that everybody else is picking up. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Other questions, comments, kind of before we kick off? I guess just of, of our FAC crew, uh, just again, I, I recognize a lot of the names. Uh, which, which one of you guys are new on, on this time around? You look familiar. You look familiar. Though. You weren't on last time. Nope. Okay. Just a familiar face. So <laughs> I know when we went, and the name sounded familiar. So I, I, as I went around, the, the, so well, oh, wonderful. I, I, again, any other? Um, I guess subject matter people. Again, maybe some of you are seeing this for the first time. Any any questions? I know Dave's kind of gone over it a little bit. Any question from subject matter folks? All right. So again, we're going to focus a little bit, just again, kind of what we have um, at these facilities. Again, super brief overview. Uh, again, today, tonight was uh, intended to, uh, I, I always like the analogy of, you know, mile wide and inch deep in terms of, of getting into some of the details. Um, I, we also just kind of wanted to note again, we know that from the last time, probably a few of you remember, there were some pretty long meetings. So again, part of what we were hoping was the, the, these would all be, uh, you know, roughly 60 minutes to 90 minutes. We wouldn't <laughs> extend any out. I think we had a few that lasted three hours last time, which is as tough for anybody. So, uh, so again, starting with north, um, I, I always love these diagrams because it, it, it shows a really kind of clear picture of, of what the district owns um, in this particular case. Uh, again, having two um, high schools, both of them are, you know, in pretty pretty um, you know dense residential areas in terms of you know they're, they're full they're, the boundaries around the, the buildings are are full there's not a lot of opportunity to grow without you know picking off a whole bunch of houses which is pretty difficult 
And a lot of these items that we're talking about, you know, fields, multi-purpose, pools, um, they take up a lot of space. So anytime we're looking to add on uh, to any of the facilities here, we're losing parking, we're losing current amenities and those types of things. So I think, you know, as we look at the existing facilities, as we look at opportunities, if, if either of these sites are a good site for um, any of the amenities we look at, we're obviously very challenged because we're, we're displacing something very likely that, that already exists on the site. Uh, floor plan wise, obviously many of you got a good tour of the building um, coming in here. Uh, again, kind of as I look at it, this is really kind of our public uh, core of the building up here with our athletics, our gym, our, our ca uh, cafeteria. Um, this is kind of the other a little bit of the public core down here in terms of, of ability to access the, the um, auditorium. And then our academics kind of fill in uh, the middle of the building. Second floor, obviously, you know, we're right about here with one of the coolest stair staircases in the state. <laughs> a little bit of space on the second floor. Um, again, these plans are a bit old. It was identified kind of as the, as the wrestling space up on the second floor. Subject matter experts, is that still true? Is wrestling still up there? Yeah, in the balcony. Yep. Thank you. So again, kind of honing in. Uh, uh, Gym, gymnasium facility, uh, locker rooms, pool, and then our, our weight room space um, within the facility. Um, that really forms kind of our indoor uh, athletics uh, side of the building. Um, a few pictures. Wonderful school spirit with the Spartans and the bleachers. I guess subject matter experts, maybe just specific uh, in this particular case to the, you know, your gym facilities, um, just maybe two or three points of, you know, um, uh, I'm putting them on the spot, so, but I, I think that that's okay. That's why they're here. Yeah, so just, you know, two or three points about, you know, your facilities in terms of the, the gymnasium fitness, um, you know, what it does well, maybe what it, or where it's lacking. Well, we got new bleachers. Uh, this is our fourth year with new bleachers before that. They were really, you know, they were they were from '72. Uh, our, our gym's in real good shape. We, the district has done a, a good job of maintaining the floor. We went from a tartan, a rubberized floor, to a wood floor in 2000. So that was a, a big improvement for injuries and durability and that sort of thing. Got several, lots of compliments over the years on, on that one. But uh, our weight room, that was. Uh, Built, added on in like uh, 97, 98. So it's it's probably too small. Back in 97, 98, it, it was probably big enough, but it, it's not anymore. Uh, I, you know, that the field house is used spring, summer, winter, and fall. Sometimes till 10 o'clock at night during the week, and and till 9 o'clock on the weekends. So it's it's used by youth, the clubs, the high schools, the rec department, you name it. So it, it's it's the north and west gyms are probably two of the busiest facilities in the entire district, bar none. From from three till nine or ten, and. Uh, and then obviously they're used for fire during the day, so. So I didn't have a, a great picture of the pool when our, apparently when our team went through the buildings, they, they must have skipped the pool that day. Um, our aquatics uh, expert, I guess, if, if uh, anyone representing North on the aquatic side, just a couple of comments about, about the pool at North. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so back in 2002, the WI came out and actually the National Federation of High School Sports and said that you need to have four foot of depth to have starting blocks. Well, the North Pool, both, both ends of the North Pool are 3-6, all right? So we have been hosting our meets out at the YMCA, the 20th Avenue YMCA was a brand new facility back in 2001 and they graciously allowed us to host swim meets out there. 
the issue with that, as we found, is when it's not your stuff, you get bumped, you, are, you play second fiddle. Uh, if stuff is broken, you know, kind of, well, deal with it. Uh, you can be part of the problem or part of the solution. So we have not hosted a swim meet since uh, the fall of 2002 at North. Uh, when, when the Y isn't available, then we, we uh, piggyback with West, and hopefully they don't have a meet. We are able to practice in our facility. The, the big issue there is uh, if you're a, a swim person, you watch. We don't have any doc starting blocks, so we, we put two in our, our deep end, and we have, we've had the worst starts of, of any of the six or seven FEA teams for the last 20 years, and that's, that's no joke, just because we've only got to a normal, a normal pool, we'll have six to eight lanes and have access to those at all times. Well, we can't have the, the kids go off the starting blocks because that's also where both the North and West diving teams practice and compete for the most part, and so we have to be creative with our practices between those two groups. So we've, we've made it work. Uh, probably too well, to be honest, <laughs> but that, that's, that's our current situation with our pool. And we can't, if we touch any of it, you have to come up to code, which means new gutters, new filtration, all that stuff, and, and it's, it's, it's not cost effective at all. It's probably more than you wanted to know, but that's the truth. <laughs> All right. That's exactly what we wanted. To <laughs> um, West uh, Auditorium is kind of an interesting uh, building. So this is actually set up. Uh, set, uh, I heard a little laugh. Uh, it's actually set up to be a couple of different lecture spaces. So there's a, a series of operable doors that allow you know the, the it to function as a large er uh, space, um, or those doors can be broken up and. Each of the, the uh, individual spaces can also function. So, I mean, in essence, you could have four different kind of meetings going on within that space. Although I'm guessing those walls are probably less than ideal in terms of sound transmission. So, uh, the practicality of it probably um, not as great as, as the reality. Um, again, uh, uh, so interesting facility. Um, the, the stage is, is pretty small by today's standards. Um, and really just no amenities at all in terms of you know dressing rooms and back of house type um, amenities that you would see in a, in a, in a newer facility. Um, so again, I, not to steal too much of your thunder, but I'm sure our subject matter experts probably uh, a few more comments, so. Okay, so um, this facility is used for usually about two plays per year. So Building needs a performance space. We don't want, I don't think they want the spaces with the number of seats, but it needs to have fly space, wing space, dressing room space. It needs to be a theater. So it's, it's also inadequate in, in all of the lighting, all of the sound. Um, also, from the school's perspective, you can barely get even one grade, let alone a school, into an auditorium. So. It, it, it was really, like Randy said, really never designed for the performing arts uh, ever, but it, it's, it's very, very, very uh, 
un unusable at times. The new space really needs to be able to handle the elementary and middle school concerts as well because we're getting rid of the only other auditorium that's of any size besides the Alberta Kindle, and you're carrying that, and we're going to tear that one down. That's in Wetsuit, so there won't be any other auditorium besides the Alberta Kindle. So that, you, that needs to be sized so the elementary holiday concert with the parents and the kids will fit in that space. And Tom Hansen certainly can speak to that because he's the auditorium manager and he's going to be out there. We need to shake the pressure off of that building and put those kinds of events here as well. The seating with all of the rooms open is a maximum of 548. So that's, that's really nothing. Uh, in the band world, we used to try to have the old eighth grade bandorama there every other year, but we couldn't do it because the middle school bands didn't fit on stage, and the audience didn't fit in the room. And well, of course, there's the acoustics and the lights and all the other problems. Uh, yeah. Wait. All right. Well, I'm just curious, and since we're talking about Webster Auditorium, is that decided? that it has to be demolished along with the rest of what's here. Uh, we haven't designed that building yet, so um, I, I, we haven't, uh, um, that, that was initially part of the plan, yes, to, to, to demo that, the entirety of that building. Um, but uh, we haven't designed the building yet, so I... Most likely it will have to go because you're going to need, need that space for classrooms. You're going to have 650 elementary students at that site. So the, that space is, is most likely going to be. It's another situation where we're, we're the, there's a pro and con to that. It's a beautiful space, right? It's right alongside the lake, et cetera. It's going to be gorgeous. But the, the downside is you're confined to that space. So uh, it's, it, does, it does restrict you with what you're able to do. Yeah. And, and ultimately, if you had an ideal, if you could literally forklift and jack up an auditorium and move it over here, you probably want it here versus there. And that, that, that's kind of the discussion that's been had in terms of fixing this space uh, being, being the highest priority so far. All right, moving on to West. Um, so again, a uh, nice size site, uh, but again, we're bound on, on all four sides by uh, residential and various other uh, buildings and entities. Um, again, uh, difficulty with this building is it's all one story. So you can imagine, again, if uh, Dave's imaginary forklift could pick up uh, one section and place it on top, um, there, there'd be a little more uh, real estate here to work with, but uh, again, we built a California building in Wisconsin, and um, we continue to uh, have to uh, d deal with uh, the challenges of that uh, well into, into the future here. Um, I, I sort of uh, skipped over the um, uh, outdoor side of things a little bit intentionally, so again, I don't know if a few people from the um, outdoor side just kind of want to talk through uh, just in terms of kind of the, the the practice or and or competition side of, of what you guys deal with maybe maybe one from each building yeah I'll talk a little bit just in a general perspective obviously the biggest improvement in recent years has been the track um, which the two high schools when it comes to middle school track meets host all of the middle school meets at that site so what that means on days when we have a middle school meet our high schoolers basically have limited practice but the track improvements have been nice we've just redone the tennis courts the big challenge with that has been spectator access because we were really stuck with having to rebuild the courts on the site themselves, which meant we couldn't make them longer to put bleacher seating inside. We're, we're restricted with city ordinances when it comes to bleacher access and what we can do as far as getting too close to the sidewalks. Uh, we put underground sprinkler systems in a number of our fields about 15 or 20 years ago in order to try to keep the green space as adequate as possible. But um, that is always a challenge um, due to challenges with irrigation in the ground and in the winters we have. Um, our baseball field and softball fields are on a busy street. 
So um, when I always cringe when we host a track meet or a baseball game, fear of some kids gonna run across the street, chasing a fall ball and get hit by a car because of the traffic. Um, parking is a disaster for our spectators, especially a middle school event when every mom, dad, grandma, grandpa's coming to watch their child run a track meet. Parking is all over the place. Um, we've got a couple coaches here that can comment some additional on the outdoor. Um, probably the biggest thing, you know, everything Brad said, the thing to add on or think about is just that land that it's built on is there's not a flat spot on the whole area. So there's a spot where one person might be two feet lower than the other person over here. Um, and it, they've worked hard to try to keep that level. They put a lot of time and effort into trying to make that look nice. But in, within two years, it's, it's sinking again. And it could change from year to year. For example, the uh, softball diamond turns into a lake every time it rains. We've helped that drainage a little bit. But what's happening now is the, the, the soil's going up and down. So um, it's really unpredictable. and. Um, it's nice to play next to the school. That's probably one of the coolest things ever. You walk out the door and you're ready to play. Um, that's probably one of the nicest things that I can say about the facility. <laughs> but, um, I do want to add one thing, Tim, if I can. Um, drainage is a real problem. So our competition soccer field is by the staff parking lot. Um, when it comes to snow removal, we have to dump all of the snow as far as it being plowed on that south end of the field so it wasn't that long ago where we had a spring of a lot of uh, snow melt late and a lot of rain where it was May before our girls got to practice on that outdoor space not even play a game but practice so we have a number of drainage issues just because of like coach said there's it's not level it was never built and when you try to put our three baseball teams and two softball teams out there they can't all practice we only have one baseball field, so our, our freshmen sometimes just practice on the practice football field because there's not a diamond that they can actually get on on a regular basis. So, Same thing with soccer. We're limited there with the, the space. Can I ask a question? Was that original site part of that original like garbage area that Red Arrow is? I mean, is that the same problem? Because Red Arrow has the same problem with those fields. Was Very that similar. also, was West site also? Well, that, that whole area was that one time was pretty much a swamp. Yeah. You know, freak was that whole area was so always swamp filled then was whatever at one point in time just to, to make it usable space. So that's why I think we have a lot of the settling and a lot of the up and downs of what's going on there. Um, whether you can just say putting in drainage, proper drainage to the area would help. I don't really know if that would. Um, I know another thing that you guys did, did I know is just the facilities themselves for restrooms. I mean, oh, you look, we have one little, on the corner of the track, we have one little area with restrooms that softball, baseball, track, tennis, everybody has to use. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, when you have a lot of going on, that's not, you know, and I think the boys has one stall and two urinals. That was you know, built so. by our booster club. And it's right. not always open for baseball games. No, <laughs> like port like potties that. At softball and baseball use port potties all summer long. So that's Otherwise, like kids will be business. peeing in the garage. <clears throat> It's hard when you bring And the thing about too, those facilities are used all summer long. I mean, if you think of, we just talked about the indoor facilities, Craig mentioned, it's always being used nonstop. Our, between our cages that are there, the diamonds, the track, the everything is used from sun up to sundown all summer long. So, I mean, it's a lot of work on our, our um, custodial crew. They do a nice job. Um, coaches do a nice job keeping it up, but it, it just takes a beating. And, so same topic, North, uh, anybody from North uh, want to just kind of speak to the out outdoor side of things? Well, outdoor wise, we were fortunate enough that uh, Drew and, and crew, we are, we have, do have a new turf field. So if you're looking south of Smith there, east of the track right there, that, that's going to be a brand new turf field where we're going to play varsity soccer, boys and girls, north and west. Uh, it'll double as a football facility, so that that I mean that that's a, other than the track. That's the only other outdoor improvement that, that we've had in the, the 22, 23 years Brad and I have been here. So that'll be a tremendous help. But all the other things that that West has described, we experience them as well. All right, thank you.
Can I add one more thing to that? Like I, I know just from talking to the North coach, like one of the challenges is they used to have practice at Schumer Field, and then they would have practice at the high school. And now with the turf field going in at the high school, which is unbelievable, it would be great to get out of Titan Stadium. It's almost like they've lost two fields because like we at West will be playing our games at North, which didn't used to happen. So now that's displacing practice time that they would have previously used. So you know it's kind of a mystery of well where where are those kids going to go? You know when we have games going on and, and whatnot. And, and Schumer Field, if you don't know, is next to Merrill, which is going to be the new middle school. So that field will be gone. Uh, again, so looking at West, again, our, our like I said, our California style uh, floor plan. Again, our academics um, take up a lot of uh, real estate on the uh, on this side of the screen. That's the south side of the building. Um, it does work out well in terms of segregation of the building. Our, our athletics and kind of public zone kind of over here. So they're, you know, there's um, they're keeping, you know, the activity kind of in one place. And then our auditorium, the Kimball, um, in, in this corner here, uh, the northeast leg of the building. Uh, so similar to uh, north, if, if the west crew kind of want to talk about some of the internal um, the spaces, kind of more on the gymnasium fitness side of things. So in the, Steve, you'll probably know, mid to late 90s, when the new gym. And yeah, in, the, in 96, the new gym and well, with the gym tool and the weight room were added on. That space was added on. Um, so at that one time, time the, the basketball teams were bused to the rec center, some of them for practice. So the, the two gymnasiums have some advantages over a field house, but really, I, I, I'm not aware of a new high school that's probably built that doesn't have a field house. Um, the gym is restricted. It, it, it's a 1960s facility that's had new bleachers added as really the only improvement. Um, from a security standpoint, fans, it's great because you're right on the floor, but it's also a nightmare trying to get people walking into the building during a game, you know, to get to a seat. One time an I knocked an official over that ran into me walking down the sideline. Um, we have no air conditioning in the gymnasium or weight room. The weight room uh, was added on. The booster club helped knock a wall out that used to be a classroom to expand. But our strength and conditioning numbers now are, are going through the roof. So obviously from a space standpoint, it would be better to have more space so those kids aren't so compact and congested in there. Uh, and, and probably one of my biggest frustrations is when we're doing summer cats with our middle school kids or summer camps and it's you know 80, 90 degrees, the building is just sweltering. It, it's, you know, when you ask kids to go in and work as hard as they can in a weight room, and you have no air conditioning, and it's 90 some degrees with humidity, it's just unbearable. And, um, you know, this fall we had some athletic events where I asked the custodians to get me the temperature, it's 80 degrees at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night in our gym. It's just extremely uncomfortable for spectators, you know, our athletes, coaches. So, you know, not having air is one of the biggest issues there. And part, of the, part of the problem is too is um, the mechanicals there, um, as you're saying, your California design, all your intakes are all bringing your hot air off a flat roof. So when you're trying to bring in fresh air into a building, the fresh air you're bringing in is the, the hot air coming off a flat roof. You're not bringing any, you know, so it doesn't help the situation by, you know, Brad will say, can you open up the outside dampers more? Well, it's not gonna help me any because I'm just bringing in 100 degree air that's coming off the roof. So the other big challenge for us is the um, the wrestling area and the gymnastics, which is a co-op program, are practicing in our upper gym area in our main gym. So they're very small spaces. And whenever we have large events that go on, whether it be a basketball game, for example, and we need to pull bleachers for spectators, that means those practices are cut short. They have to pull back their equipment and they're not able to do some of the things that other schools are able to do. And for our gymnastics, for example, if we ever have to pull both upper gyms, they lose two hours of practice the night before and two hours of practice the next time because of the takedown and setup. So 
it's it's just you know we make it work but it is far even remotely too ideal for those two programs thank you uh, west aquatics mm -hmm. you. Thank you. i'm speaking on behalf from uh, 1982 to 2015 i'm no longer the coach right now um, but as far as um, whoever the architect was for the pool at that time, I really want to thank that person because at least they had enough sense to put in 12, 12 feet so that we had our starting blocks on the deep end of the pool. And we were in 12 feet of water, so when WIA did make the change, um, we were still fortunate enough that we could host our meets at West. Um, in the past, from the, from the latter part of the 80s to the early part of the 90s, we did, we were able to run championship meets over at Oshkosh North. Um, we did run the WIA sectional meet over there. We have run a number of conference meets at West, but right now we no longer are able to do any of that as far as with our space. Um, we do not have the adequate space to run that kind of meet with the size teams that we have in our um, district, our FDA district. From, I'm speaking from, like I said, from that time frame from 82 to 2015. Um, you know, with, with the additions that were put on put onto the building, um, when I first started coaching, they had the doors for the pool were right where you put the addition on. So when you had, if you were a swimmer in December, January, you had that cold air coming right through down into the pool right away before that addition was put on. Um, for one example, now with that addition on, that's a big help. Um, as far as for practices, things like that, we have a six lane pool. We go 12 feet deep on the deep end um, to three feet six on the shallow end. Um, if you have a team of 60 plus girls, which we had, you would utilize four lanes, lanes one, two, five, and six for your swimmers. And in the middle, before we would, before we combined with Oshkosh North, we had the divers going down the middle. So you had kids in the outside lanes, you had divers going down the middle, and you had to be very creative that you put one swimmer in lane three and four, and you told the diving coach to make sure that your divers didn't go until your swimmers did their flip turn. <laughs> so we were, we have been very creative with the ways of utilizing that pool. Um, like I said, you know, we've used every part of the deck space as we possibly could. Um, you know, we have lane markers for practice. We have lane markers for swim meets. Those reels are on the pool deck behind the starting blocks plus the rack for the touch pads. You know, at times it looks like it's a junkyard because you have so much stuff on the pool deck that you have no space for the teams to, you know, to walk around when you're running invites anymore. So like I said, that's, you know, it's so crowded. Um, so so you're, you're looking at, as far as are there right now, um, I'm not sure how many teams we've, we've gone to as far as with the Natalie Bowman invite or anything. Um, but like I said, I'm speaking from, from past experience. Anything particular that you would like to know about? You know, we put everything, either the storage room in the girls' locker room, there's a storage room in the boys' pool locker room. Those are full of equipment. There's really no room anymore. Um, before the scoring deck was built in 1996 by C.R. Meyer, we used to have the scoring on, on the deck. So fortunately, we were able to, Wayne Pettit was a coach at that time, and they were able to put that scoring deck up on top, which really opened up things as far as for any of our invites at that time. Um, but that is now, since that was 1996, that is starting to get really worn in certain specific areas and stuff. Um, we store as much of our equipment underneath that stairwell as possible. Um, the pool is very utilized during the summer months. I work for the rec department with swimming lessons. We have swimming lessons in there in the morning. We have rec department swim team in there in the morning, and we have evening swimming lessons. Um, our special ed department utilizes the pool um, at times throughout the school year. Uh, let's see what else. What else? Anybody? Need? It floods on the, the yes. starting block starting end. Block ends. Yep. The water overflows. So you're continuous, you have to actually assign a person to be the squeegee person. And I have that down on my list of workers. You're just the squeegee person, the squeegee the deck, you know, because there's two spots, right? At the very beginning when you walk in, and at the far end of the pool, the shallow end of the pool, right in front of those bleakers, bleachers, you get a you get a puddle inch and a half deep. The only other thing I want to add, Carrie yeah. and Steve, you might know is I talked to our HVAC employee about the ventilation of the pool and basically what I can remember is nobody ventilates a pool that way anymore 
and Steve, you might be able to elaborate, you know, the problem with it, but we have challenges with the, the smell of chlorine, how warm it is in the pool. I mean, is, if you're in there in the summer, it is unbearable, unbearable to be in the pool some days. It's just, if you look at the picture on the right, and you can see the banner and the scoreboard and stuff on that wall, and you can see that tan line at the bottom of that wall there, that is where your air comes in for the pool. That's the only section where that air comes in. Really? It's not a duct system. What it is is there's a tunnel underneath there that is probably five foot by seven foot wide, and that air passes through that tunnel and up through them vents. So it's not an enclosed duct work. So you're actually you're pulling the air from the tunnel as well. The other That's problem is so that we're talking about the water that they get up on the upper deck. Every time we have a swim meet, I have three to six inches of water down in the mechanical room because the surge tanks cannot handle all the students going in the pool at one time. So when I literally go down by my pump or by my chlorine feeder down there, I'm walking in two to four inches of water. The other thing with the air ventilation is when we would get to a specific time, like in the summer or then when I coached during the boys' season, you, you couldn't breathe in there, and so we opened up the pool doors, and then we were told that we can't open the pool doors because then that, and I understand that, that's going to trigger the whole heating system to pump in more heat or anything else. So you were kind of combating against yeah. all these different things because you couldn't breathe. The kids, you know, some of them can't breathe, so you got to get some fresh air in there, and then yet that's going to up the temperature. All right. Thank you very much, yep. Evans. <laughs> Sorry, here, here are the pictures for the gym. So I think that they're, for those of you that maybe don't, aren't familiar, so the gymnastics and wrestling are actually behind where these bleachers are. So these bleachers get pulled towards us and kind of form kind of a quasi wall. Um, and then they, they can do their activities behind that. But when they have a big competition, like this picture shows, those bleachers get pulled back. It's kind of an extension of the overall seating. And then they, they obviously lose that space um, as functional space. Let alone having to tear up the gymnastics floor and reset the gymnastic floor every time, which is a timely process. All right, uh, the Kimball's perfect, so we can move on, right? Oh, no. Getting close. <laughs> okay, so let me give you some background. Uh, West High School was built in 1961 without an auditorium. Uh, private money was raised to build the auditorium, uh, and it was added on. In at uh, 63, it seats 1,400 people, roughly. That's not the exact number. Uh, once it was built, it was basically ignored by the district for about 60 years until last year when a bunch of updates went in there. Thank you so much. They were needed. The fly system was replaced because the old one hadn't been inspected in 50 years and failed miserably. The new fly system is amazing. Lights, sound were all updated because everything was a million years old. Uh, but that space gets used by literally everyone. District meetings, the West Music Department, drama, most of the North Music Department uses it as well. Choir concerts, orchestra from North there. <coughs> District staff meetings, West staff meetings, athletic meetings, every elementary school doing their concerts in there. Uh, the area community band, the youth symphony, Jolly Jester, Richard's Dance, Julie Sutton Silver, Crosby Dance, Miss Oshkosh, Miss Wisconsin, and about a thousand more groups. It's used all the time. Scheduling an event in there is nearly impossible. It's very troublesome. Uh, we, as music staff, have been bumped for outside groups, even though we've been told that this won't happen. It happens. Uh, and just scheduling is, is a nightmare. Uh, right now, the West Musical is in there rehearsing, and their shows are this week, and we have been very nervous if, if we have a COVID outbreak and have to try to push it to a different weekend. And they're like, there are no other weekends. It's full. Uh, it's a big space, which is great. My kids go to Oakwood, and when the K-1-2 concert was in there in December, the place was full. 1,400 seats full, great. Um, so what else can I tell you? Uh, oh, it does not have ample bathroom or lobby space. That could definitely need an upgrade. When outside groups use the auditorium space, they also tend to use the music department space. Uh, every year, choir and orchestra items are lost, stolen, broken. Uh, because outside groups are in there. Uh, outside groups like the youth symphony, the community band use all of the band equipment. Uh, so our band equipment gets well used, not just by our students, but by outside groups. Um, 
I think I have more, but my brain stops. <laughs> well, again, tonight. Dan said it all. Yeah, well, and again, tonight. Th th oh, go ahead. I remember the other thing. Uh, up until some point that Randy might remember, uh, North also did their musical there until they went and started doing it at the Grand. Correct. And there's not, again, that was facilitated or, or needed because there is no performance space. Let's not pretend that there is. When was Kimball So. Another thing that they could, that's needed uh, at the Kimball Auditorium is better lobby space, better bathroom space, and storage. Right now, uh, musical theater and drama from both high schools rent a private storage unit to store stuff in out of their budget because they can't keep it on site. All right. Well, th thank you guys all again. We'll, we'll, that was an awesome kind of overview of kind of each of them. Again, we're going to kind of just give a little bit of a preview of kind of of each of these. Again, we've just had some preliminary discussions. I, I think the part of this is we really don't know what any of this is going to look like yet. So again, you're kind of, I, I joked earlier, we're kind of building the plane in the sky a little bit um, as we go through this process. Um, but we have had a couple meetings with staff and, you know, a couple things. It's always great, you know, you know what, what are we looking for? What would we like to hope to achieve? Um, so just kind of from that initial conversation, these were a couple of the facility, kind of like facilities within the state that were mentioned. So uh, this is the Hodeg uh, Dome up in Rhinelander. Uh, it's about three, four years old. Uh, been fortunate uh, to spend a, a little bit of time in it. We're working with the district right now. Um, but it's a full 100 yard um, uh, turf field within the dome, um, as well as I think there's five or six basketball courts uh, and or tennis courts on, on kind of the far end. So again, it's a, it's a big gigantic bubble. This is held in place with air. So if anybody's been, uh, the only other one I can kind of think of uh, that you might have seen in Menominee Valley in uh, Milwaukee, uh, UW Marquette has one. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, there you go. Right on the road. <laughs> um, so in Rhinelander's case, they do keep it up year round. Um, some of uh, some other others of these, again, uh, UW. I know UW um, or um, University of uh, Marquette takes theirs down uh, periodically. Uh, so this stays up all the time. Um, this is a <laughs> interesting picture because this is an 18-team wrestling meet. Again, probably can't quite see, but an 18-team wrestling meet. Um, ha happening in here and it I mean it literally looked like there was nobody in the space so they were all kind of pushed down on one end uh, I, I was I was kind of floored um, again just kind of gives you the, the, the sense of scale and size um, a little bit more on the I would say on more the permanent structure type um, that we just completed this in West De Pere. this is uh, 60 yards of turf um, so this is what you're seeing in uh, Kimberly uh, Kakana has something similar to this. Um, uh, uh, Plymouth, I believe, has one. So these are these work. Are, I think are a little more common um, that we're seeing um, within the within the state and kind of in the general region. Um, so again, um, uh, turf uh, flexible for soccer, for for uh, for football. We do set it up. Uh, you can kind of see home plate here. Uh, batting cages. So. A lot of the same amenities as Rhinelander, but just a, a little bit uh, scaled down version. There's no reason this couldn't just get extended uh, to be 100 yards um, if, if the goal again is to try to achieve that. So again, some quick points again, kind of in co cognizant of time and we're gonna kind of go through this, but one, you know, one of the things we're gonna wanna do for each of these facilities is really kind of start to lay out what the goals for these are. So. Again, just real quickly, a shared use facility. Uh, it's flexible indoor space to accommodate many different activities. Uh, it's funny, Kimberly and West De Pere uh, said it would be a wonderful testing site for their students. They didn't have anywhere to st for their testing site for their students to meet all the requirements. So uh, they utilized that as a means to justify it. Uh, obviously increasing practice space, uh, increasing opportunities to host many different uh, types of events. Uh, like I mentioned, wrestling um, uh, and, and other things that you can do within there. And obviously the big one is that, and, and mentioned with, with the, the softball swimming pools was um, <laughs> that it allows for practice space during uh, inclement weather or um, the lack of weather that we have in the state. Uh, Performing Arts Center, again, our company's been very fortunate to do a number of these throughout the state. Again, um, you have a, a nice example with Kimball. 
Uh, these two are examples. This is Ashwaubenon, that's um, Gay Electric Tremplo. Um, so these would be a little bit smaller facilities compared to Kimball. These would be about 800 student or 800 seat uh, facilities. Um, the distinction kind of in that general size range is anything, we kind of think anything over kind of the eight to maybe 900 square feet, or not square feet, seat, um, auditorium is where you start to require a balcony. So the general rule of thumb is I can still see um, facial expression and have the intimacy of you know being part of performance and seeing expression of people on stage from about 150 feet away. Um, once you get beyond that, you, you kind of lose that intimacy, lose that connection. So that kicks you up to the balcony to try to still maintain the, the, the closeness of, of being close to the stage while accommodating that. So again, we'll get into the, the details of that as we go through, but just kind of wanted to quickly explain that because um, that so, uh, seat size is kind of a, a, from a number of different perspectives, kind of lends itself well to that. Uh, again, goal here is providing high quality facilities at both high schools. Um, um, does each location need to be the same size? Um, again, um, options to increase the, the North facility in size and amenities. As, as we said, we're a little bit smaller here. We're lacking a lot of amenities. Um, how do these facilities currently support and how do we want these to better support uh, both the community and the districts moving forward? So again, just big macro goals, but again, we'll, we'll jump into these once we get to these um, topics. Um, uh, aquatic facility, again, um, very fortunate to have done Ashwaubenon fairly recently, a, a great facility uh, up in the Bay Area. Uh, this particular pool, so it was, it was mentioned earlier about the, um, the, the starting blocks and the diving. Um, so this pool, um, and there's all kinds, of, again, without getting into the particulars, but there's all kinds of um, uh, requirements in terms of the depth of the shallow end, but you can see here we do have the starting blocks on the, 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 um, the deep end of the pool. We do have the overlap with the diving. What's unique about this is we did do a therapy, a warm water therapy pool um, for, for their particular facility. Um, and the other cool thing about this was it was a joint community um, school district effort. So there was a lot of emphasis on how this would both benefit uh, the district as well as the community at large. Uh, this facility, I believe, seats about 500 people, so it's, um, I think it's become kind of a popular destination as far as, um, you know, sectionals and different types of meets. The, the seating in this particular case is up on a mezzanine level. So again, uh, potential goals here, district-wide shared use facility, uh, both for practice and competition. Uh, hosting tournaments with potentially for the goal of that you could be a, a host location for sectionals. Uh, access for community use, um, you know, do we consider separate diving and swim lane areas to allow for simultaneous events so we don't have to be creative with which lanes are our swimming lanes and, and so on and so forth. And then just some other additional considerations of, you know, a splash pad, um, warm water therapy, again, pools are um, interesting and unique um, facilities and a lot of op uh, interesting opportunities. Uh, and then finally, again, outdoor competition and practice facilities. Uh, again, I think what we're talking about is far, uh, you know, uh, in terms of um, goals and things we're accommodating, but uh, our, again, our company was very fortunate to just do the Sun Prairie project, um, which is uh, about a 5,000 uh, 5, seat um, shared um, facility for what will be their new uh, Sun Prairie West High School and their existing what will become Sun Prairie East. So uh, again, excited to go through this process to kind of talk through how this, this partnership and, and, and some type of shared facility, both in terms of the competition side and, and the um, practice side, um, starts to form and look. So again, goals, just quick goals here. Again, district-wide shared use for track, soccer, baseball, softball, football, uh, more practice space, uh, spaces and opportunity. Um, plan for the future home of outdoor competition venues, um, supporting tournaments and sectional events, and then parking, as noted in a couple, I mean, that's a big consideration that we have to look in, in any of these options. So again, um, just a, kind of a jumping off point to kind of uh, wet your whistle, so to speak, as we um, transition to um, the next meeting. So again, thank you. Um, the, the next meeting then will be uh, Monday, February 7th. And we're really going to focus on that indoor uh, athletic piece at that time. Great.
All right, well, thank you so much, Clint and, and Dave, for uh, providing that. Um, again, as you can see, um, a lot of needs out there. Uh, you know, I think a, a lot of us have been living with that need for, these needs for a long time. Uh, so what we really want is an opportunity to be able to really understand deeply those needs and then to try to get a, a line of sight here so we can resolve as many of those as possible as we're looking at the cadence of our long-term uh, facility uh, solutions. Uh, like I said, some of which may be private donations, some of which may need to be public referendums as we're moving forward, so we'll have to kind of play that out. But we really want your input and, and to see, you know, what are our priorities? We know we always have limitations, uh, but uh, we want to be able to work through those and use our experts to be able to help inform that process. So any, any questions um, at this point? The only other thing I would, I would add is, is uh, continue to brainstorm, bring up ideas. Even if we're unable to, to operationalize those ideas, we will still look at those ideas. You know, the example of the auditorium piece, you know, could we potentially uh, retain that? That's something we'll look at. I, I just don't want to get your hopes up that that's, given everything they're going to put there, that that space is going to be able to be carved out. But we do, we, t we track that, we take it forward, we say, hey, how about this, how about that? We will do this next meeting, but it's, it's our thought that we're going to do these things before the high schools get replaced. I mean, I know it needs to be done, right. but I think about like Webster's Auditorium that was just redone like the last 10 years, and now we're going to tear down the whole building. You know, I, I worry that we will struggle to sell great facilities that then need to be torn down. I thought, well, we were going to rebuild less. We were going to rebuild it on the fields and flop, right, so that school could continue while you built, built the new building. Right. If you build new facilities, then what do you do? Yep. You so, know, so I mean, like, how do we? Yep. Uh, yes. And I'm so, not saying it shouldn't be done. I just. Yeah, that, that's part of what we, I think we need to wrestle with. And that's why I say when. And I think we need to develop kind of a line of sight of how this is going to go, especially with phase two and phase three, I think, to be able to think through, you know, all the way through the finish line so we're not building and tearing down and, and repairing. And there's a lot of things that, that go into that. But I, I think, um, you know, it's not only on our school campuses, but what other locations do we have in town maybe that we could take advantage of uh, with some partnerships to be able to, you know, help put some of these facilities um, in Oshkosh, but not necessarily on our school site. So that's really all, all part of the conversation uh, that we'll have over the next couple of months. Um, coming out of this, though, to your point, I think it's important not necessarily to have a defined, like what phase two and what phase three are, but to have an idea of location and, and what our priorities are as we're moving forward. So as we build phase two and think through phase three, um, you know, we'd have a pretty good idea of what locations we're looking at so we don't, you know, run into that same issue. But even if we don't, like when we were when we were starting to get donations for an indoor practice facility, we didn't just, you know, one of the things we had to take a look at was we looked at the concept of if we rebuild West on site, where initially would that footprint be so that when you put the put the other facility there, it stays and the rest gets remodeled, remodeled around it. One of the things we're going to have to look at is probably going to be Kimball. Okay, if we replace West and Kibble's right there, how do you, you know, how do we do that? You know, and that's that's where we hand it off to really smart architect people who help us take a look and go, well, you can do it one way or you can do it another way. So that's a really important point because we're gonna uh, we're gonna have some facilities that won't necessarily have that problem. Maybe they'll be off site, and yet you'll still have some facilities of the on site. So we're gonna have to really be thinking about that. Good point. And I think you know, like for me, you know, if I was a taxpayer and I start looking at West High School. The upgrades that we've done on that building in the last 10 years between windows, uh, HVAC, um, now our electrical, I mean, to me it's going to be a hard sell to the taxpayers to say, no, all of a sudden now we're just abolishing all that. You know, that, that's a lot of money, though, in boilers. I mean, we put all new boilers and heating in that building. It's Yeah, yeah. So yeah. well, there, therein lies the challenge of every school district because you can't, you can't not maintain your facilities, right. yet you can't wait in terms of, you know, so that's why you've got to kind of at some point, you know, when you think about it, even think of the new windows, you know, at the time, whenever we get to that glorious moment when we replace West, those windows will have served a pretty good purpose for probably more years than we thought. 
Right. You know, so I, I do think you, you get to a point where you kind of got to go, okay, we gotta give up this. at what point do we jump? You know, and, and, I, and I think that's the cool work of this group and the cool work of the school board. Any other questions? Can I just say that I really appreciated the content experts? Yeah, they're, they're pretty good, aren't they? Yeah, and we'll, we'll continue to bring them in individually then when we get to these specific areas to get, get a, a lot deeper. We really need a better name, though. You know, I, I, I just put subject matter expert. I didn't even think about it. I'm like, it's not very catchy. You know, I think we need a cooler name for that. <laughs> well, Dave, Dave actually sent me an acronym, in, and he just had the acronym in it. I spent like a whole afternoon, like, just what? what He's I, like, what's I the felt, sneeze? I felt, the, I, I felt too uh, insecure emailing him saying, what is SME? And, and then I finally dawned on me, I'm a subject matter expert. <laughs> yeah, truth be told, I was going to come up with a catcher name, but never had the time to really think about it. So. So again, thank you so much. Um, we'll make sure that we're staying on time and get us in and out of here. So uh, if you have any other questions, you know, we're, we'll stay around for a little bit. But thank Thanks, you so everybody. much. We'll see you next time. Really appreciate it. Yeah.